Hey everybody, welcome this morning to the Chapel Jonesboro Online. We are so glad that you chose to join us here this morning. Let me tell you, God's about to do something in your homes like he has never done before. Here's what I need you to do, just like last week. If you got people sleeping, go wake them up. Tell them God's about to move. If they're sleeping really hard, dump a bucket of water on their head. Yeah. Baptize them in the name of Jesus and get them to your living room to worship. And then next, I need you to hit that share button. Share this. Invite your friends and get ready for a worship experience and encounter from God like never before. Here we go. Get ready. Give God a shout of praise in your home yeah. and let's worship. Step out of the grave Break into the fire And don't be afraid Run into wide open spaces Great days Waiting for you Can't like the way has been lifted Great days Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is freedom. Come out of the dark, just as you are. Into the fullness of His love. For the Spirit is here at their feet. Yeah. 
walk into the fullness of His love. All the Spirit is here, there be freedom, let there be freedom. Has been lifted, grace is waiting. Come on, Dad. Dance like the weight has been lifted, grace is waiting for you. Dance like the weight has been lifted, grace is waiting for you. Dance like the weight has been lifted, grace is waiting for you. Oh, 
I want to say that there's someone this morning that you're watching this and you're in your home and you've been dealing with depression this week. You've been dealing with anxiety this week. You've been saying, how am I going to make it? How am I going to get through it? I want to tell you, begin to give thanks to the Lord. Begin to praise the Lord. Begin to worship the Lord. Open up your doors. Open up your windows. Give a shout out and say, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to take this time to Remind you to remember your tithes and your offerings. That the kingdom of God will continue to go on. And it says in Psalms 107, it says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. For His mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Whom He has redeemed from the hand of the enemy and gathered out of the land. From the east, from the west, and from the north. And from the south, he says, I am reaching to my people from the east, the north, and the south. I am pouring my spirit out on their homes this morning. I am stirring up the atmosphere that you will know that I am the Lord God. This morning, I want to remind you that there are two ways to give this morning here at the chapel. If you're watching this live stream, the first one is cash out. That is dollar sign, the chapel, Jonesboro. And the second one, you can mail your your tithes, your offerings to us uh, to 1565 Commercial Court, Jonesboro, Georgia, 30238. And I want to thank you because uh, we've been uh, been overwhelmed with the response of your giving in the way that you have responded. 
Coast. Let me tell you, the devil's a liar. He's trying to get into your finances. He's trying to scare you and tell you you're not going to have a job or you're going to do without. But I want to tell you, he said, I've never seen my people go begging for bread. So I want to pray this morning as over that seed that you're going to give and you're going to plant. Because I want to tell you something. The ministry that you have tagged into this morning is in fertile ground. It's in a ground that things every day, blessings are coming. We've had testimony after testimony of people say, I didn't know where it was going to come from. And all of a sudden, I went to my mailbox and there it is. All of a sudden, my boss called me, told me that he's going to give me extra money this month. He, all of a sudden, uh, I don't know who's going to take care of my kids. Somebody called and said, I, I've taken care of your children. Bring them over this week. So I want to tell you, God is still moving. God is still moving. So we want to bless this this morning. Father, I thank you today, God, for your people and the obedience that you have instilled in them to give, Father. Lord, that through this difficult time that you're bringing us through, that we learn the point of obedience, God. We learn the point of sacrifice. We learn the point of serving God. And Lord, I thank you this morning because over everything that is placed into this ministry from your people, God, there's an abundance of overflow coming back into their homes, back into their jobs, back into their future, into their health, into their well-being. Lord, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray, amen. The weapon may be firm, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. The God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. Jesus, every war he wages, he will win. Yes, Lord. I'm not backing down from any giant. I know how this story
I love, I love what that song says. I love that it says, I'm going to see a victory. Why does it say that we can see the victory? Because the moment that we accept that the battle is not ours is the moment that the victory is already won. We have to walk in that victory. We have to live in that victory. Right now in your homes where you're sitting, you may be battling something. Some of you maybe actually have the virus. But can I tell you, this morning God says the victory is yours. It don't matter what it looks like. It don't matter what it feels like. All that matters is that the victory is yours. Can you give God a shout of praise? Yes. I want us to turn our Bibles to Luke chapter 19. Verses 29 through 35, I'm going to read this scripture. Luke chapter 19, verses 29 through 35. It says this, And it came to pass, when he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany at the mountain called Olive, that he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite of you, where as you enter you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it. And bring it here. And if anyone asks you, where you why you are loosing it, then you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, why are you loosing this colt? Verse 34, it says, and they said, the Lord has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus and they they threw their own clothes on the colt, and they set Jesus on him. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we come to you right now, God, and we ask, Lord, that your will will be done in this service this morning, Lord. Father, I pray that the words that I speak will not come from my flesh, Lord, but will come from directly from you, God, and that somebody somewhere, Lord, will get something that puts them in 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 a new vision this morning, God. In the name of Jesus, amen. So we've all evidently, like, I've been watching a lot of churches' live streams, and they have lost the art of look at your neighbor. So we can still do that in our homes. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, get ready. God's about to do something. Look at your neighbor and say, wake up. You should have not went to bed at 3 o'clock. Hallelujah. This morning, I want to preach to you from the context of a need, an expectation, and a tear. A need, an expectation, and a tear. So today is a very important day in the history of the church. It is Palm Sunday, and a lot of people may say, well, why do we celebrate Palm Sunday? What's the importance of Palm Sunday? What's the importance of this week they call Holy Week? And I want to break it down to you like this. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago in a place called Egypt, all right? A place called Egypt, there was a man named Moses who was sent by God, and he was commanded to go into there and tell Pharaoh to let his people go. And if he didn't, God was going to bring plagues upon, his, upon, upon Pharaoh and Pharaoh's people. And so Moses did as he was commanded, and it kept going on and on. And then one plague came to where it was the angel of death was going to fly over all these houses, and it was going to kill the children in the neighborhood. And God gave a specific command to Moses, which was to put blood on the doorpost. Not just any blood though, okay? We could have easily took a human and put a blood, but that's not what God was asking. He said, take a spotless lamb, a lamb that has no blemish, a lamb that is perfect, 
I want you to sacrifice that lamb and rub it on the doorpost. And now hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years later, where we see ourselves in the text, Jesus was coming into that celebration of Passover that they were celebrating as the spotless lamb. And so this morning, I want to jump right into my text because I've got a lot of information and I want to get it out. My first point is a need. We see in the scripture that there was a need that Jesus needed. And you might say, well, why would Jesus need a need? Ain't he God? Isn't he all-powerful? Yes, he is. But can I tell you, he still needed something that day. The need was a donkey. Our text tells us that Jesus said to go to this town over there, not where we are, but over there, there will be a colt tied to a tree. What is a colt? It is a young donkey. I want you to go there, and I want you to untie this donkey, and if they ask you what you want, Why do you need this donkey? Tell him, because Jesus has need of it. Because I have need of it. So they did as he said, and they went and got this donkey. But there's a significance about this donkey. And I had plenty of other sermons that I wanted to preach on the donkey, but I just couldn't get it out of my spirit to preach them the way that they needed to be preached. But this is the significance of the donkey. The donkey had never been ridden. The scripture said it had never been ridden. He was not tamed, he was not broke, and he was wild. Okay, so what's the big deal? Have you ever seen a wild horse? I I have. I saw a a person who was not very intelligent get on a wild horse and ride it bareback, and he looked like an idiot the whole time he was riding it because it was slinging him up and down. If you've ever seen a wild horse, you know that you will not get close to that horse without getting kicked, bucked at, spit on, or knocked out. Okay? Okay? Horses have to be tamed. The same with this donkey. He was not tamed. So imagine the disciples walking into this town. They're already doing something that Jesus told them to do, that they were like, really, we're going to go repo a man's donkey? I don't think that's really smart. But they went and they did it anyway. And imagine them walking up to this donkey who was wild. This donkey that never had anybody on his back. He was tied to a doorpost. He was tied up. So imagine the disciples walking up to him, and they're, they're all walking, and they're like, and the donkey's, and he's, and he's, and he's starting to get real, real aggressive, and they're like, Mm-mm, not today, God, Mm-mm, not today. I love you, Jesus. You're going to have to ride somebody else's donkey. You're not right. And they're like, well, we can't go tell the master that. So they're getting closer. And I can imagine, I'm paraphrasing, I'm paraphrasing, I can imagine that they looked at this donkey and said, hey, you got to go. Jesus wants you. And this donkey's <laughs> kicking and freaking out. So I, I painted the picture pretty good. I hope I didn't look too stupid painting that picture. But this donkey was wild. The donkey was wild. It had never had any sense of doing anything else but the task that it was destined and made to do. The disciples guided, our scripture tells us, and they managed to bring him back to Jesus. And Jesus, of all people, got on that donkey and rode it. He sat on that donkey and rode it into the town. Okay, what's the big deal about that? I can tell you this. The donkey was wild. But the moment that the master himself touched upon that donkey was the moment that that donkey's life and training had changed forever. I'm here to tell you this morning in this place and in your homes, you may feel a little wild. You may have been in the bars last night doing things you shouldn't have done. You wasn't because they were closed. You were in your home in front of your children. You were doing things that you wasn't supposed to do. But God says, with just one touch of my hand, I can tame you. But you have to release it. Let's get back to the donkey. The donkey was tied up to the post. The donkey had one specific purpose, and that was to do what the farmer asked it to do. That donkey was designed, if you look up what donkeys do, they do farm work. They do general labor. They pull things behind them. They're pulling a plow behind them. They're carrying goods behind them. In the definition, it didn't say that anybody rode the donkey. When I looked it up, very, very, very seldom do you see someone actually riding a donkey. You see a piece of equipment strapped on to the donkey. The donkey is only as good as his master slash teacher. The donkey can only do what it's told to do. It can butt, 
It can kick. It can say, I'm not doing this today. But at the end of the day, the master controls the donkey. You see, we're much like this donkey. We are much like this donkey. We have accepted one way of living and have allowed ourselves to be tied to it. You notice I didn't say that someone else tied us to this. Because no one ties you to what you're doing. You tie yourself to what you're doing. No one told you to go buy that pack of cigarettes. No one told you to go in that bar and get wasted. No one told you to smoke that crack. No one told you to get in your car and drive drunk. No one told you to get in that relationship that you had no business getting into. You tied yourself to it. This donkey was tied up, but can I tell you, he could have broke loose very easily. I mean, yeah, for granted today we see the ropes and the things we have, and they're very tough. They're very stiff. We have better means. But back then, they didn't have no technology. That donkey could have bucked and got himself away from that easily. He allowed himself to stay tied to something. And because of that, we're able to relate to this donkey today. There are things in our life that we have been tied to for far too long. And God is trying to show us it's time for us to untie ourselves. God has a need of us. Easily, Jesus could come in and untie us. But Jesus says, I want you to untie yourself. Because the moment that you untie yourself is the moment that I can do greater in your life. Can you give God a shout of praise where you are? That he wants to do something good with you. That he wants to do something greater with you. That he wants to use you for the purpose and the will of his father. God will take something you thought was only intended to do one task and purpose it for far greater. There are people in their homes that are sitting there today that were told they would only do this one thing in life. There are women that are sitting in your homes that you were told, girl, you were created to cook. There are men that are sitting in your house that were told, oh, you're not going to be nothing but a construction worker. Can I tell you that's a lie from the pit of, from the pit of hell? God created you to do something extraordinary, and you don't have to settle for someone's mind games that they've told you your whole entire life. God said, yes, you might have been intended and purpose, and your parents and your family or your loved ones might have told you that that is all you're good for, but today I am telling you I can repurpose you for something far greater than what you were ever intended to be by man. Just like that donkey, you might have been tied up and intended for farm use but the next day he was carrying the Messiah into the city you might have thought you were washed up and done but God says I've got something greater for you than you can ever imagine God needs you and I'm sure a lot of people in their homes we can laugh in the church I'm sure a lot of people in their homes are saying you're dumb pastor Lee you can't sit here and say, God needs me. But can I tell you, if you're still breathing here on this earth, God needs you? Can I tell you that if you were born on this earth, God needs you? If he didn't, he wouldn't have sent his son. If he didn't, he wouldn't allow you to still be breathing. You may be saying, well, what, what, what should God need of me? What should God need of me? Can I tell you this morning that God needs everything you have? But the problem is we've tied ourselves up. There are people sitting in their homes who says, you know what, Pastor Lee, I've tied myself up and I know that I'm called to do something greater, but I just can't kick this one thing. I've got this voice inside of my head that keeps telling me I have to do this. I have to live this way. I have to be this way. I have to cover up this gifting. Can I tell you that this morning is the morning on Palm Sunday 2019 that God says it is the time for you to untie yourself because the mission field, the battlefield has never been greater than today itself. What is done in the past past is over with. It's time for us to walk into the future and do what God has called us to do. It's time for us to untie ourselves. A donkey tied up can only go as far as his rope allows him. A donkey tied up can only go as far as his rope allows him. You wonder why you keep getting pulled. 
You wonder why you keep getting pulled back. You take three steps forward and you take five steps back. You take a step forward and you take ten steps back. You wonder why that keeps happening. Because you are still tied to the root of the problem. It's time this morning that we don't just untie the rope. It's time this morning that we just don't do untie the root. But we take a spiritual axe and we cut ourselves free from what is holding us back. We will never get forward or go forward if we're still tied on to something. You might say, Pastor Lee, I'm dragging it. I'm dragging it. I'm tired of watching Christians drag something. That's the problem with Christianity today. Churches have preached, come in, give it to God, go on. But you haven't taught them how to take it away. You haven't taught them to stop dragging it. What you've done is you have pacified a problem. It's like a baby crying. When a baby cries, if you go in there and feed it, but don't change its diaper... You're not doing anything. You have pacified it for 30 minutes until it alerts you again that it's messed its britches. Church, we've messed our pants and we fed ourselves, but we haven't cleaned ourselves. It's time that we take that out of our lives and kick it as far as we can. It's time that we walk in the future, the calling and the anointing that God has placed on our lives. It's time that we untie ourselves. Why? Because God has need of you. It's time to give it up. It's time to let it go. It's time to set ourselves free from it. And you notice I said set ourselves free from it. Because you have no business trying to set someone else free if you're not free yourself. All you're doing is tying them to your situation and your problem. All you're doing is creating chaos and calamity for them. Because you are still tied to something. You have no business trying to untie someone else. I need to get on before I get into somebody else's Cheerios. You may ask this question, so why does God need me? Isn't he God? Can he do this by himself? Yes, he can. I've said it three times already in this sermon. Yes, he can. But God put you here on this earth to carry out his will. I said his will. I didn't say your will. I didn't say your mother's will. I didn't say your father's will. I said his will. See, we think about Easter and we think Jesus came for the people. And while, yeah, he was here for the people, the ultimate plan was he came for the Father's will. He didn't come for anything else but to fulfill the will of the Father. And because the Father's will is that he loves you, that's why he came. He came. And he put us here on this earth to carry out his will. A lot of times God's purpose of needing you is so you will loosen yourself from what's keeping you from him. Have you ever been laying in bed in the middle of the night and you feel, well you don't feel, you know you can't go to sleep. And you know that there's a reason why you're awake but you just continue to lay there. And you continue to wonder, man why why can't I go to sleep? Was it the Dr. Pepper I drank before bed? Was it the monster energy drink? Was it the chocolate milk? Possibly the cookie? Possibly the birthday cake? I don't know. Why, why can't I go to sleep? Can I submit this to you this morning that maybe you're awake because God needs you in that moment? Because God needs you in that moment to carry out his will. There might be someone who's about to pull the trigger and they're about to kill themselves right now. We're we're watching. They might be watching this. But God says this is a time where I need you. I need you to be that voice. I need you to be my hands. I need you to be my feet. I need you to carry out everything I've commanded you to carry out. It could be in that moment that that life is saved. It could be in that moment that that person starts slit, stops slitting their wrist. It could be in that moment that that person cuts the noose that's holding them and about to kill them. It could be in that moment that addiction is set free. It could be in that moment that homosexuality is cast out. It could be in that moment that alcoholism is gone. It could be in that moment that God does exactly what he needs to do, but he needs you to do it. God has all the power. He has all the authority. But in return, he needs you to operate in that power. He needs you to operate 
operate in that authority. Our Bible tells us the same power, the same authority, the same anointing that raised Christ from the dead is alive inside of me. It's up for us to wake in that power inside of our body. It's up for us to wake in that authority inside of our body and exercise it. Why? Because God needs me. Just as Jesus needed that donkey, he needs you to carry his message everywhere you go. Well, Pastor Lee, I'm stuck in my home. I'm stuck in my home. Yes, but my God, it's 2020. It's 2020. It's 2020. Where are you watching from this morning? Your home. I'm not saying for everybody to start a podcast because some of you have no need being on a podcast. I'm not saying for everyone to start a church because a lot of you don't need to be pastoring a church because you can't pastor your home. What I'm saying is it's time for you to be the voice and hands of God. It's easy for us to go on Facebook and bash everybody else. It's easy for us to go on Facebook and bash other pastors. It's easy for us to go on Facebook and say, well, look, there they go again. But can I tell you, it's even easier for us to go on Facebook and say, I love you. I care about you. God loves you. Can we, let me give you a quick story. Years and years ago, there was someone who was in our church, and they, they had distanced themselves from God, and they stopped coming to church. But there was a burden upon Pastor Sabra, and I hope you don't get mad that I use this. There was a burden for that person. And every single day, that person would get on Facebook and say, eh, F this, F that. They would cuss constantly. Pastor Sabra didn't go on there and judge. She went on there and said, I love you. I love you. I care about you. And because of that faithfulness, that person walked back into the doors of the church and got their life right with God. What I'm telling you is criticism needs to go. Criticism has to go. This is not a time nor season where we should criticize one person. It is our job to lift up that person. Why? Because God needs us. They're not listening to God. They're listening to you. They're not tuning into God. They're tuning into you. Well, Pastor Lee, that's completely wrong. Yes, but they're not spiritually mature enough yet to open their Bibles. So we have to be that Bible. We have to be the hands and feet. We have to be the one who says, you know what? God loves you. Just like Joshua 1 and 9 says, have I not commanded you to be strong and courageous for the Lord your God is with you. Don't kill yourself. Don't talk like that. God's got you. But it's never going to happen if we don't activate ourselves. God needs you. My next point, an expectation. An expectation. And you might be saying, okay, Pastor Lee, this is not a traditional Palm Sunday message. You're talking about expectation. Have you ever expected something and it didn't really turn out the way you thought it was going to be? Like you ordered something and it got there and it was terrible. Here's an example. I've got two great anointed brothers, Jeremy and Logan. And when we were in high school, if we got good grades, we, at the end of the year, we got one big item. Well, I got a guitar, and it was what I expected it, it to be. Jeremy and Logan ordered mini bikes. And these mini bikes, I'm going to tell you, they were cool. I thought they were awesome myself. This is the story. Jeremy and Logan waited on the front porch all day long. I think it was 6.30, 7 o'clock before they actually showed up to the house. They waited all day long talking about, man, when that thing gets here, I'm going to put some gas in it. I'm going down to the cul-de-sac, and I'm popping. Oh, I'm going to boom. I'm going to go crazy. They were so excited about this. And then, boom, UPS pulls up. And they're like, oh, man, what can Brown do for me? I can tell you he's bringing my pocket bike. It's about to go down. They get to the truck. And two boxes come out of the truck, and, you know, the boxes were le relatively large for, for what they were. They open the box, and the bikes aren't even put together. They had to put parts on the mini bikes. They get the bikes together. They get gas in it. The things don't run like they're supposed to. They're bogging down because it's new. It's a little tiny carburetor. I mean, it's, it's hard to get, get right. And they finally get these things, but they look like Goliath on a Barbie bicycle. Especially Logan. I mean, Logan's six foot four, 
on a little pocket bike and his knees all up in his, all up in his face. And it was the most hilarious thing to see, but their expectation of that was great. What I noticed was, is I never saw them down the mini bikes. I never saw them get upset that they were minier than what they thought. I never saw them throw it when it broke down. I saw them rolling the, rolling the little thing back to the house to get it fixed. You see, the people had an expectation of Jesus' arrival, but it didn't go their way. We read in John chapter 12, John chapter 12, verse 16 through 19, it says this, His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. Therefore, the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of his tomb and raised him from the dead bore witness. For this reason, the people also met him because they had heard he had done this sign. The Pharisees, boy, we got some Pharisees in our world today. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, you see, that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. They were expecting something that didn't quite fit their expectation. Well, what were they expecting? I've got a few expectations I want to share with you this morning. They were expecting revolution, but instead he gave them revelation. They were expecting Jesus to walk up in here and say, Boom, baby, I'm here. Jesus didn't do that. They were expecting Jesus to walk in and overthrow the government. They were expecting Jesus to come in and say, I'm making an executive order. you got to stay in your home. Boy, this is fitting for today's time. They were expecting revolution. He gave them revelation. Have you ever seen revolution? Have you ever watched History Channel any? And seen like back in the day when... The people in Germany revolted and they tore down that wall and everything was free. They were celebrating. They're all on top of that wall. And they're like, we're going to the other side. We're going to do this. Have you ever seen revolution and how excited the people were in it? But the whole entire time, they missed the revelation of what truly was going on. Jesus was coming to bring revelation. They were looking for him to shake things up. See, that's just like us. We come to church. Church is great. We go to the altar and we say, God, this is the morning. Jesus, you're going to shake things up. God, Lord, I know Sister Susan on the second row is going to bring me a word today, God, because I need the word. I need the word. Today is the day, God. Revolution in my heart, Lord. Revolution in my life, Lord. It's the day. Today is the day. And then God brings you revelation and you don't like it. God says you're going through this because... You've tied yourself to something. God says you're going through this because you need to change this. But you're expecting God to come in and change everything right then, right there. This is what the people were doing. They were expecting Jesus to come in and go completely crazy. The disciples even said this. They did not understand these things at first. It wasn't until Jesus was glorified. Till Jesus had died and had already rose that they eventually got it. This is foreshadowing we're seeing in our scripture. The disciples didn't understand it. Even Jesus' followers didn't understand why Jesus wasn't going in here and saying, boom, boom. Yeah, I'm going to tear down that right there. Boom. Yeah, these Pharisees got to go. They spread in bad rumors. They got to go. Boom. They did not understand why Jesus was doing what he was doing until after Jesus had been risen from the grave. Through all of this, Jesus was trying to give them revelation. He was trying to show them why he was about to go through what he went through. Maybe today you're asking for a revolution, but God is trying to show you a revelation. Maybe today you're asking for God to do something in your life, but God's trying to show you why he's doing this task in your life. Think of it like this. Maybe, just maybe, this whole coronavirus, COVID-19 thing, is for God to give us revelation. 
Maybe. Maybe, just maybe. Through all of this, God is trying to show us something. Now, I'm not saying this. What I'm not saying is that God created this. But what I am saying is he is allowing this and he is using this so that we can open up our eyes and see what we have depended on for too long. That materialistic things that we have depended on for too long. That man, that woman, that fix that we have depended on for too long. It's ironic, but it's not because it's God. That this is 2020 and when we think 2020, we think vision. Everybody's got their slogan, 2020 vision, 2020... How more fitting is it that we are in 2020 and that God is using this circumstance? He is using this no-name virus because I, I choose not to give it a name. I don't give authority to anything that was created to do evil. I only give authority to the thing that's going to bring us out, and that's God. He uses this no-name virus to open up our eyes, to give us 2020 vision so that we can clearly see what he's trying to show us all together. We have depended on a building for far too long. We have depended on man for far too long. We have depended on religious activities and religious things for far too long. God says, I need you to get a relationship with me. I need you to get a relationship with me. It's not about all these things. It's about where your heart is with me. But we failed miserably. We have failed miserably. What are you doing in your homes when we're not live? Are you reading scripture to your kids? Are you putting worship music on and turning off Fox News and CNN and hearing all the reports every single day? And seeing our president get fed up about having to report every single day and hearing our governor talk about it every single day, turn it off. At this point, you've been ordered to stay in your home unless you're going to do something essential. So cut it off and turn on God. Turn your vision from that to him. It's time for us to twist what we're looking at and fix ourselves on what we need to look at. It's time for us to let go of everything that's holding us back and enter in to everything that he would have us have. He's using this to show us a revelation that all we truly need is him. That's all we need. We don't need buildings full of people. It is amazing. I love coming into church. I wish that we could come into this service this morning and it'd be completely packed out with people. I love assembling together with people, but if our fixation is only on the people and not on the God, we have lost what we are supposed to look at. It's time for us to fix our eyes upon Jesus. Then and only then will he give us the answer. They wanted revolution. We want revolution today in this time, but God says you need revelation. Thank you for clapping, Pastor Jalen. My next one is the people. This was their next expectation. The people expected power. He gave them peace. The people expected power, but Jesus gave them peace. They had heard of the great miracles that he had done. Many had either heard or seen him raise Lazarus from the dead. They saw that he walked up and said, Lazarus, come forth. They saw the miracles. They've heard of the blind man being healed. They heard of all of these great things, and their expectation was that Jesus was going to come in, touch them, and they were healed. That Jesus was going to come in and fix right where they were. That he was going to show his power. But instead, he came in and brought peace. They wanted to see his power at work, but he said, you know what, now's not the time because in seven days, my power is going to be at work larger than what you've ever seen it before. See, we think about Jesus and we think about that picture, and I'm trying not to get on the Easter message today, but we think about Jesus taking the lashes for us, and we think about Jesus dragging that cross behind him, and we look at it, and we look at it as despair. We look at it that, oh, Jesus He's getting tore up. And while it is a gruesome, gruesome picture, it is the ultimate display of power. 
It is the ultimate display of Jesus' power. Why? Because he should have been dead while he was getting beat. He should have been dead while he was dragging that cross. He should have been dead when they nailed the nails through his hands and feet. But yet he lived. They expected power, but he gave them peace. And this is the greatest thing about this. We look at the great city of Jerusalem and what's its name? The city of peace. The city of peace. And Jesus is considered and named the Prince of Peace. And here he is coming into the city of peace where there is chaos, where there is craziness, where people are trying to kill him with a posture of peace and not power. Jesus came in there ready to, could, ready to do the will of the Father. The people were looking for a showman. The people were looking for someone who was going to come in and show everything in his arsenal. But Jesus was looking to come in, fulfill the will of his Father, and do that in peace. Ain't that just like us? We're always looking for the miracle. We're always looking for the blessing. And in return, we completely miss the peace that's right in the middle of what we're going through. There is peace in the middle of your circumstance today. There is peace in the middle of your addiction today. There is peace in the middle of your situation today. You have to open your eyes to see the peace. There is peace in the middle of you staying at home. There is peace in the middle of the grocery stores when that lady's cussing you out because you took the last ham. There is peace everywhere you go. But you have to to tune in to the peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, coming into the city of peace to be killed, to bring ultimate peace. Not to bring a display of power, not to bring a display of revolution, but to bring a display of peace. His ultimate will, the ultimate will of the Father was that so people, when they died, could come to Jesus, believe in Jesus, and have peace everlasting in their lives. The people's expectations were too limited. They limited God on clearly what they wanted. They had already set their minds on what they wanted to see, and in return, they robbed themselves of what they needed to see. They expected this great, glorious, awesome man who is all-powerful to walk into this place and do these great things, but they limited what Jesus could do. Jesus wanted to do those things for them. Jesus wanted to heal them. Jesus wanted to show them how great God is, but he had another way of doing it. The people wanted something temporary. But Jesus was coming to give them something permanent. This whole passage, this whole Palm Sunday message is about Jesus walking into a town, not walking, riding into a town on a young donkey that never has been tamed to bring peace and to do something great into their lives. But they were so fixated on the right now that they couldn't see the next week. We're so fixated on what's happening right now that we can't see what God's going to do in June and July. We're so fixated on what's happening right now that we can't see what God's about to do in our next few days. We're so fixated on the fact that we can't pay our bills and we're waiting on that stimulus check that hasn't hit yet that we can't see God's already made provision. It's already all there. But we're wanting something temporary. Because that's all this is. That's everything we're going through right now is a temporary moment. It is a temporary fix. It is a temporary situation. And Jesus says in a few short moments, I am going to bring something far more permanent in your life than you have ever experienced before. But where will your expectation be? Will you be expecting a miracle? Will you be expecting me to do something great? Or will you not limit me with your expectations? It wasn't time yet for Jesus to fulfill the will of the Father. It wasn't time for him to say it is finished. It wasn't time for the veil to be torn yet. It wasn't time for him to die. It wasn't time for him to raise from the dead. It was time for him to humbly, humbly make his way into the city and prepare himself to be the ultimate sacrifice. Passages after this, Jesus predicted his own death. 
Jesus began to unveil to the disciples what was about to take place. I believe Jesus knew it before he ever got on that donkey. I believe Jesus Jesus knew exactly what he was doing before he ever made his way there. I believe Jesus knew what he was doing when he raised Lazarus from the dead. I believe Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. But unfortunately, everyone around him didn't understand it. Unfortunately, everyone around them had their own persona, their own expectation, their own agenda about what Jesus should come and do during this time. But Jesus said, I'm not here to fulfill your agendas. I'm not here to fulfill what you want me to do. I'm here for one reason and one reason only, and that is to fulfill the will of the Father. This brings me to my last point, and I want to read this. In Luke chapter 19, verse 41. Luke chapter 19, verse 41. And we we hear a lot, a lot of people in the Bible say Jesus wept. Jesus wept. And we think of another scripture, but we completely miss this scripture. We completely miss the most important weeping that Jesus has ever wept. My last point is a tear. And it says this in Luke chapter 19, verse 41. Now, as he, Jesus being he, drew near, he saw the city and he wept over it. He cried over what he had saw. It says as Jesus drew near, he hadn't even arrived yet. He hadn't entered yet. And he wept. What does that tell me? That tells me that everything I just read you just a few short minutes ago, that before Jesus even encountered the people, before Jesus even heard the people's agenda, before Jesus even heard the Pharisees talking, before Jesus even even acknowledged that the disciples didn't understand, he cried because he knew what he was about to experience. Why would he cry? Why is this significant? Because Jesus knew that the people's expectations were wrong and that the disciples didn't understand what he was doing. He knew that he was riding in on a donkey and the purpose of this donkey was to fulfill the prophecy from years and years ago. He knew He knew why he was riding. He knew why he was humble, but they didn't. He cried because he knew now was not the time for him to come in and touch someone and they be healed. He cried because he knew that they did not realize that he was that spotless lamb. He cried because he knew the people had their own agenda. And his agenda was after one and one only, and that was the Father. He cried because he knew that in weeks... In just a week's time, seven days, a lot changed in seven days. The people were yelling, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. We praise you, God. Here he comes, the king. He's coming. And in a few short days, the people were hollering, crucify him. Why? Because their expectations were in the wrong place. And because of their expectations... Because of their their wrong vision of what they expecting, Jesus shed a tear that day. He wasn't crying because of what he had to do. He was not crying because he knew he was about to die. He was crying because the people who were closest to him, his disciples, the people that should have known his agenda, should have known what he was doing, of all people did not understand What was going on? He knew that in a few days, it was going to be time for the Father's will to be completed. Today, I want to leave you with this. That on Palm Sunday, one of the most celebrated days in our our belief, that yes, it's about rejoicing. Yes, it's great. Jesus has come. We are rejoicing of a Savior who paid the ultimate price. But even more, it's of a God who says, I need you. I need you to continue my work. I need you to do my will, not yours. I need you to open your eyes to what I am showing you. I need you to be expectant of what I am going to do in your life. I need you to not put limits on what you think I can do. I need you to know that I love you and I care about you, 
And I will always, I will always take care of you. And everything that the enemy meant for evil, I will turn around and change it for your good. Palm Sunday, we have made it such a religious thing in the past that we've completely missed the revelation and the message of what God was trying to say. Jesus was coming with a need and expectation and a tear to follow. Today, God needs you and needs you to expect him to do the impossible in your life. But will you allow it? I want to pray before we do communion. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for what you've done. Lord, Father, we, we submit ourselves to you right now, God. And Lord, we say, Lord, we know you need us to continue to carry out your will. And God, I will do that this day, Lord. Father, Lord, we're not going to limit you to what we believe you can do, Lord. Father, we're not going to limit you from what we believe you can do, Lord. And we believe that today, every tear that is cried over every single thing we go through, Lord, you will turn around. And you will make it good, Lord. We love you and we praise you and we lift you up. Can you give God a shout of praise in your house as we transition for communion? If you've got someone in your home with you, look at them, give them a high five and say, man, that guy can preach. <laughs> if you're alone, just say it out into the atmosphere. So this is the, the point of time. And as we explained last week, we will be doing this each and every week coming into your homes um, um, leading through this entire time that we're not able to assemble together. So go ahead and get your elements that you've prepared for communion. You may say, oh, I forgot about it or I don't have it. Grab you a loaf of bread and whatever you juice or Diet Coke, whatever you got. Because see, this thing is about the heart. This thing is not about this piece of a thing that they give me the face tastes like plastic honestly but it's about the symbolism that's in your heart so go ahead and grab cracker bread juice water whatever it is that you want to use um, to take communion this morning as we prepare our hearts to receive and participate in communion today I want to remind you that it was from this very thing that we are fixing to symbolize that has provided all the freedom and healing you will ever need. This is what an awesome sermon that we heard today leading up to uh, the, the, the uh, story of resurrection for next, next week. But this is what we are doing that we symbolize in obedience to the holy command of God. You see, we have freedom from every force of darkness that may come against you. And today it's because of what was shed on Calvary that we have that freedom. Freedom from the very bondage of sin. Freedom from man-made ideas and religions. And somebody there needs to say hallelujah. Freedom from man-made ideas, programs, and religion. It also offers us healing for our body, healing for my soul, healing for emotions and the things that go on in our mind. In other words, everything that we will ever need or need in the future has already been provided on the cross. So I want to pray before I administer this communion to you. So bow your heads right where you're at. Father, I thank you today for the sacrifice that you gave of your only son. I thank you that you have provided absolutely everything that I will ever need on the cross of Calvary. I thank you that when Jesus said it is finished, it sealed the deal on my behalf that I could walk in freedom today. And God, I thank you for healing in advance, Lord, that is taking place in my body from the blood and the, the wounds that were shed on Calvary. I speak a blessing over this sacrament today that we are participating in. I pray that everyone that will be receiving communion this morning from their homes or from this place of worship realize the holiness and the special moment that we are in. I bless this bread I bless this juice that represents the, the blood of your son, the bread that represents the body. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew 26, 26 and 27 says, And as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, This is my body, 
which is broken for many. Take and eat and be healed in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for healing, God. Then the word says that he took the cup and he gave thanks and he said to them, This is my blood, the new covenant which is shed for many. And I want to pause just for a moment because this is not in my notes this morning, but the Lord had spoke to me as I was coming up the steps over here. And I want to administer this part today in healing. And I want to speak over every young mother that is in your homes today. And you're trying to figure out how to be shut in your homes with two or three or four, some of you even more children that don't understand. Some of you are experiencing anxiety that you've never experienced before. Some of you are experiencing emotions that you don't know what to do with. And so God says today that this is for everyone, but especially for you young mothers in the home, that you hold this up and you speak this, that he said, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for the healing of many take and drink and be healed in your mind in your body in your emotions in the name of Jesus Lord I thank you right now God for everything that you have done God by faith I see a miracle working in every home that is represented today Lord every person that that may have a fear or or a, a, a feeling of they don't know what to expect in the future God I pray for the peace to come over them right now Lord I speak against anxiety I speak against fear I speak against depression I speak against the spirit of suicide Lord, I pray for peace and hope and love to come back into the homes right now. In the name of Jesus, I thank you for what you are doing. And everybody said amen, amen, and amen. I want to thank you today for joining in our live stream. I want you to know that Pastor Donnie and I love you very much. That each and every single day we are calling your names in prayer. We're thinking of you. Thank you for the phone calls that we receive, the text messages for the few people that have come and knocked on the door and we've kept our distance from you. Thank you for that. We love you. We miss you. And we are longing for the time that we can be back together corporately to worship. We appreciate all of you who have been faithful to this ministry. Pastor Ed already mentioned this earlier. Your response to the need during this time has been phenomenal. You should give yourself a hand clap. Yes, it has been phenomenal, and we appreciate everyone who has remained faithful in your tithing and your giving. God will honor his commitment to you because you have honored your commitment to him. We want to remind you that this Wednesday from 12 to 3 o'clock here at the chapel, we are giving away hamburger plates. It will be hamburger, chips, and either a brownie or a cookie and a bottle of water. We have toilet paper that we are giving away. So if you've been out and you've seen the empty shelves this week, uh, we got you covered. We'll give it away as long as um, we have it in stock here. So come. You don't have to get out of your cars. In fact, we ask you that you not get out of your cars. That we have an area that you just pull through the cones and we supply the need to what you have. Come and get your food. We may have bread to give out. Everything that is we have been blessed with, we are offering back to you. That's this Wednesday from 12 to 3. And then don't forget to tune in Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Uh, for a word from the Lord here at the chapel. I will be speaking. Pastors asked me to speak. And I know I have a word to give you that God has placed in my spirit. So again, be safe. Remember to exalt and praise God for everything he's doing in your homes and your lives. And we love you and miss you. Hugs and kisses your way. Chapel family, Pastor Lee here, and I'm super excited to come to you today and give you an update on what's going on here at the chapel. We know we have had to go to online services due to the coronavirus, and per local guidelines, we've had to make the decision to take our Easter service to only online. Now, don't frown. 
Don't get upset because this is exciting. This is an exciting moment for the church. It is the largest celebration of the year in our nation by far. And because of that, we have the ability to go into every home across America and share the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Pastor's got an exciting message planned for us. Guess what? This is our theme. We're pumped about this. It is resurrect your home. Boy, how more fitting is that right now than for us to be locked up in our homes. But what's important about that is that we have to resurrect our home. So get ready, share this video, invite your friends, get pumped up for Easter Sunday. It's gonna be great. Don't change your routines on Easter Sunday, okay? Get up, shower, get ready, put on your Sunday Easter clothes. You still can do that, all right? And get ready to resurrect your home.